Moved. Moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Motion carries. Next up, we have a presentation, Melvin Lake Wind Farm Project. Bill McLaren, President of Community Wind Farms Incorporated. Welcome, sir. Thank you, sir. I'm going to get John's going to speak here first, I believe. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just before uh, Bill gets into this presentation, I guess I was going to give a bit of a backgrounder on, on how projects like this are treated in East Hans, so uh, especially for some of the newer counselors. So the, the way these things are dealt with is through site plan approval, and we have a much larger notification than we normally would. It's 1,000 meters. Um, so far, there have been three projects built in East Hans, Nymel River, Hardwood Lands, and Walton, and the process seems to work fairly well, I think, for those. Um, there is a requirement for things like um, uh, the maximum or the, the distance that a, a wind tower has to be from a joining property line is four times the height of the turbine. Um, however, that can be reduced through an impact study. So, for example, if you get written permission from a neighbor and or if you own the adjoining land, those uh, distances can be reduced. There's also a maximum noise level at adjoining properties and so on. So there is quite a rigorous process I have to go through in that impact study. So that was just a bit of background on the, um, the process and then I'll hand it over to Bill and to go through the presentation. Thank you. Uh, Madam Warden and counselors, thank you very much for your time and your busy schedule. Just take a few brief moments. Melbourne Lake, uh, that's a lake located uh, west of the high, of Highway 2, or excuse me, Highway 1 rather, uh, near and in about the Halifax water supply. But it uh, straddles the HRM line and the East Hans County line. That's the uh, general location. Community Wind, I'm president of Community Wind. We're a small develop development company here. We've worked over the Maritimes, done a number of projects. Uh, probably the only two that are actually visible from the road, I think, is one near Bridgewater and one near Truro, which are going w uh, west on Highway one, uh, 102 toward New Brunswick. Over there on the left, uh, you'll see uh, under along a ridge, there'll be five turbines. Other than that, we're in the woods, and if you get caught in there, your vehicle might be in difficulty in some of those sites. But anyway, and we're partnered with a company called ABO World Wind. They're out of Germany. And uh, as much as we do development, uh, wind development is expensive and takes a lot of dollars. And this particular project, where it's a 100 megawatt project, it will be very expensive. We don't have those resources in, independently, so we've partnered with ABO in this situation. They've got uh, large renewable energy projects in Europe, in Asia. They're now heavy into Western Canada. And this is their first venture here in Eastern Canada, and we do their development work here in, uh, in uh, the, the, the Atlantic region. The Melvin Lake Wind Project is, is worth 3,600 hectares. And let me, before I go much further, let me say, we are at the extreme preliminary stage here of our development and planning process. So everything I'm saying here is not in concrete. We haven't done on the ground research. Uh, so everything is tentative, I guess be the word, other than our intent to move forward with uh, in the development of the project. But as I came earlier and spoke with your planning people, we, we're not interested in conflict. Uh, we want to uh, move together here. And this why I'm going to come here to make you people aware that they were discussing this project and looking at this project and would certainly invite any issues, concerns, any questions. There's certainly no touchy question to ask. This would uh, be very anxious. The, uh, it takes about 3,600 uh, hectares. It's uh, a collection of private land and crown land. The private land is in large part owned by Elmsdale Lumber. Uh, we have that land all leased and we have the crown land uh, applied for, and as, as, you, as you people all know, that's a due process, and that process is, is underway. The project area, they, you have eight of the eight of the eighteen uh, turbines will be in Halifax, and ten of them will be in East Hans. Just uh, you can see on your map, there's a little jagged line there, and those turbines in East Hans. Overall, the 18 turbines, that translates to 100 megawatts of power, enough to power 28,000 homes. And the director of planning indicated our nearest 
resonance to any one of our turbines is slightly over 1,800 meters. I don't think anybody wants them too close, and I'm in that category also. I don't think anybody wants them real close. There is a sound, but it's not significant, and that's controlled by federal legislation. Should this project go ahead in our planning process, and I indicate everything's so preliminary right now, we wouldn't be submitting our response to the Power Corporation's request for RFPs until the early days of May of 2022. And then the Power Corporation, we're estimating, will take two months, thereabouts, and that goes into the summertime. And, and not to be uh, not to be negative or cynical, but in the summertime, sometimes there is a bit of a, a lag time. So probably early fall, uh, the Power Corporation should announce their potential uh, awards. Uh, to our understanding, and this is a speculative comment, that there are between 25 and 30 firms doing the same thing we're doing around the province. So the Power Corporation will have several uh, applications to go through, and, and on the technical side, it does take time. However, I, I like to operate with a glass half full, and if we were to be awarded a program, an award, then in the fall, we'd, we'd start our environmental impact, and that will identify all the issues relative to habitat for animals. In that area, we understand there's an issue with mainland moose. Well, we'll find out just w where we are if we impact, and hopefully we don't, but uh, we'll learn that through the process. Any other animals that may be at risk or may be negatively impacted, uh, water, wetlands, trees, plants, all that sort of thing. Uh, and I won't go into detail on environmental impact studies. I think you probably all have been are very aware of them and probably experienced other firms other times uh, talking about them. That'll take, that's 12 consecutive months from the date you start. Then uh, near the end of the environmental impact study, we'll start doing uh, some engineering work, uh, primarily civil and, and uh, electrical. The actual construction won't start, won't be turning a uh, saw it over until such time as the environmental impact is completed and approved by the government. So that could take a year, it'll take a year in terms of the study and what issues that may come out of that that the minister may want clarification on or in, in the uh, citizens has a 60 day respond period. So that uh, you can appreciate, Ed, the day's up, you're getting well into the end of the calendar year. However, it's all good stuff and it's got to be done so it's done right. These things have a, a, pro, a project this size has a very substantial tax benefit to the uh, respective uh, jurisdiction. Without going to particular numbers, uh, it's, well, it's substantial, I guess. That's, that's probably the simplest way to say it. In jobs, uh, we'll, there'll be a lot of short-term jobs. And short-term jobs I describe as uh, there will be some uh, deforestation, there will be some roads built. We're certainly going to maximize the opportunity to use existing wood roads. There are a lot over there. So hopefully uh, we don't have to do too much new road construction. Uh, uh, all these civil works, gra gravel, rock, road grading, uh, foundation digging, concrete, a uh, huge host of trades we're going to require in the short term in the construction period, which will be in large part uh, a large uh, three quarters of a calendar year. In long term, uh, probably one or two jobs, two jobs, maybe three, long term, uh, and that will be uh, to, to technicians. In other cases, we've uh, people who have indicated an interest to us. We've sent to Holland College, call it NPEI, and uh, they've been trained. Then they come back and we retain those people as the technicians to monitor the sites. Many issues call, uh, occur. Uh, then they uh, notify someone in advance so we don't uh, run into serious problems or extended downturn. 
These, pro these turbines are large. They'll be approximately, and very close, to uh, 600 meters, or 600 feet, rather. It's tall. Uh, yeah. We're not going to hide them, for certain. Uh, but uh, hopefully, uh, with, the, uh, with the rolling uh, topography, uh, the visibility will be minimized, but for me to sit here and say nobody will see them, I think that'd be a bit of a misleading comment, really. Before we, uh, in, in the construction period, we'll take pictures, and uh, with the technology available now, we can input what will the visibility be of turbines. And we'll take pictures from various locales here, along Mount Uniac, and that, that stretch road along there, the head of the bay, that's a very concerned area also. So uh, there'll be a lot of due care and attention, but I certainly invite any comments, any concerns, or any questions from the council here or your staff. Uh, uh, we're, not, we're not interested in just coming here and planting something in the midst. So that's why I'm here, to certainly invite you. And there's no, there are no bad questions. In this open house right now, as I say, we haven't even got an award, so there's no guarantee this project is ever going to see the light of day. But in preparation, uh, we held an open house here in uh, sept early September over in uh, Upper Hammonds Plains. We'd hoped to hold one over the head of the bay, but because of COVID, uh, they wouldn't lease the facility. So now, uh, Upper Hammonds Plains, we held one. We've got ongoing discussions with uh, Acadia First Nations and with, uh, boy, this is a tongue twister. Spike. Yes, Spike and Agony? Spike, Spike and Okay, so I, I apologize for brutalizing that name. Uh, we've had discussions with them, uh, and as recent, as recent as a couple of days ago, we've had uh, 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 teams, teams calls. And the, see the communities of Upper Hammonds Plains here, Mount Uniac, head of the bay, are the most critically concerned areas. Uh, we've met with the Department of uh, the Environment, Department of Natural Resources, with climate change people, and this discussion is ongoing. These aren't like s snapshots in time where we meet with these people. It's an ongoing. And out in uh, St. Margaret's Bay here last week, I had a long meeting with the uh, St. Margaret's Bay Stewardship uh, Association, a group of uh, environmental people very, very concerned over the area. And uh, we had a great conversation, a couple of hours, and, uh, and uh, I was invited them to the same situation. If they see something, let us know. I mean, don't kind of get, not say anything and complain. It's, we want to know so we can fix it. And if there's issues that they feel should come forward in the environmental impact study, men, uh, please, please, men, please mention it. So I invite everyone to take this proactive approach. That's the, uh, uh, I can go into the nuts and bolts and technical side, but I'm not sure that's really, if any nobody wants to hear that, that's get kind of dry. But in terms of the summary of what we're proposing and the social impact and the, your political awareness, uh, as, as you people probably all know, when some significant change is happening and, and you have a municipality that's growing very, very quickly, you've got some very large projects in your hands here. So you know that there is, uh, a, a, some of the citizenry does have concerns and we invite to hear, hear those. So that's really the, my summary comments. Uh, if anybody has any questions, I'd be anxious to hear. And I can clearly say that this will not be our last conversation, certainly with your staff. Kelly Ash, I've had conversations with her. And uh, your, your people. Oh, yes. Apologize here. Your staff has been most helpful. Thank so, you. Deputy Warden Mitchell. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, I'm assuming this area is buffer protected of 1,800 meters. And my question would, could there be any residential construction in this area before you begin construction in 2024 or 2025 that would affect your buffer? 
Could there be, uh, well, that's never, never true, that's for sure. But if there is, uh, we'd certainly we'll keep in touch with your permit people or uh, to find out if anything, any permits have been applied for or that sort of thing. But it, in large part, we're on Crown land and uh, Elm Cell lumber land. I don't believe, I don't believe, but I wouldn't say never. I do, I do not believe. Question through you to staff, and uh, could there be an encroachment on that buffer from residential construction? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, I, I guess I haven't studied the area for this purpose, but it would be pretty difficult, I think. It, it would either be zone rural use, which doesn't allow new roads, so they would have to come here for a uh, planning process to change that. And the, I think most of the land is either Crown or owned by Halifax Water or, or Elmsdale Lumber. So the probability, I think, is pretty low that we would see development here over the next couple of years. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. That's my question. But that's something we'll, we'll watch and I'll keep track of. There's, there's always a possibility of something. Right. Councillor Hebb. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you, <clears throat> has to go through Nova Scotia Light and Power and it's a 100 megawatt project. If it would come down to maybe they are only going to allow you to say 25 megawatts, would you still pursue part of that project or would you want to pursue the whole thing in, in one unit? Well, if we had no option, <laughs> they said you will only get 25 megawatts. Uh, we'd have to uh, review the financing because you know everything has to pay for itself. There's no secret of that. So I'd have to say that uh, we have to do a careful review before we respond to that to that option. Yeah, and it may that option may very well come about. I I I mean I I'm, I I don't pursue to know everything on this, but I I know that there is a lot of projects on the board, and and a lot of times the, what they'll do is they'll disperse so much for each area and stuff like that and for your area to for this area to get the the full 100 megawatt project um i perceive that probably you wouldn't get that I'm, i could be wrong you know but i'm just wondering you know if it was uh, it would have to be substantial in order for you to go to to make the project work yeah no, no question I think, I think you're right what you're saying there i think you're whether it's 20 megawatts uh we, we've done planning should it be 50 we've done that and uh one of the large advantages here is that the project is close to, to uh, HRM, where the major demand is and where the growing demand is here. So uh, we like to think, maybe naively, that uh, that does give us a, an advantage by geography. And as you know, price always becomes a very critical factor in these tender processes. So we're taking, a, we've got a sharp pencil here and uh, 50 megawatts, I would say yes to. 20, we'd have to go back and take a really close look. Yeah, and if I may, Mr. Chair, I know two of the projects in East Hans is in my district, and uh, the uh, dividends go back to the community is uh, very worthwhile for the community. And I, and you've already kind of alluded to that. If, if it is scaled back, that probably your, your towers are gonna go on the HRM rather than the East Hand side, I would think they were because I can say the demand is there more. And um, I look at it as a counselor, for, you know, for that area there that, that the dividends coming in for that would be substantial for the community there, whatever. So, so um, uh, having said that, probably the HRM would be the first part that would be done in, in a phase one and, and the rest would be done in a phase two, so. Well, I, I, it's all, the, the entire area is all in, cordoned off into one zone by the power corporation. So whether in Halifax, HRM, or in uh, East Hans, it's all in the same zone. So there's no real benefit to lo being located in that HRM as opposed to, uh, to, uh, H, uh, to uh, East Hans. I will say though that probably our engineers, our wind and aeronautics people look a lot more carefully at the wind and what the air circulation is and those locations that has the better wind, be they in Halifax or be they in East Hans, would be where those reduced number of turbines would be. 
it's maybe not much of an answer to you, but well, uh, yeah, I understand where you're coming. My, I guess my concern is the dividends that would come back of the profits to the oh. communities. That's that's where my concern would be. You know, uh, I would hate to see uh, the wind tower be put in HRM, and they receive all the dividends from that, or if there are wind towers that let's say you didn't put them all in was in East Hands, and HRM would also get a supply of that. You know. Um, I know the, the way that it works here is that wherever the power runs, whatever community the power runs into the grid is usually the community that gets the dividends from. Now, whether your company is the same or not, I don't know. Well, so. we'll be dealing with the uh, one of the larger transmission lines. This will not be a distribution-oriented project. So the transmission line going from, uh, well, simple terms, Halifax to Yarmouth uh, runs through the property and will be... Uh, attaching, we are proposed to attach to that transmission line. But in, in terms of uh, uh, benefits to the community, totally apart from taxes, the taxes we pay. And, but we also have, a, for the sake of a better name, a community benefit fund that we take and set aside a volume of funds and we form a, a committee of local citizens. The, the uh, count, what council want to be on it, and to be one or two of us on there, sort of thing. So the, the money would be spent in some project to enhance the community, and it would be a community-driven issue. And that, that's the same as what we have now. Yes. With the exception of that uh, there is uh, just community members on, we have to make up our own committee, and we get 1% one, 1 of the profits of that section of wind towers. And that money, we, we present uh, applications for what the money is to be spent for, they review them and then they, they say yes or no and that's the way we get the money. But there's nobody on on uh, the side of the uh, provider on our committee. Okay. It's just, just a community committee is what it is. So. Yeah. And it works very well. We've had great response from them. And, 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 and it could be that way. I, uh, mm -hmm. Things are, at this stage of the game, it can be whatever. Yeah. Yeah. And, and like, you know, they, like you said, there's two benefits the, through the tax for all municipality, for oh. all the residents, and then there's a, the, for the local communities. It's a, I know the Nanaimo River one, we're getting probably about $18,000 a year. And the Harvard Lamb one, we're getting a little over $6,000 a year. And that's uh, what we like to say free money because it, it's, you don't have to work for it. You just have to make sure that you're able to spend the money. That's all. So well, the number a, per, to per tower in this situation would be greater. And multiply that by ten, and that'll give you a, yeah. a highly speculative number. Yeah, yeah. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Eldon. Thank you, Councillor Perry. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, being the councillor from from the area, um, and uh, it being my district, you know that very very much in tune with what's going on there. I also sit on the Pockwalk Water Community as the community member uh, for for. Uh, Mount Uniac, and there are there is currently, um, I believe, two turbines in the Pockwalk watershed already. Mm -hmm. um, so the Halifax water and and that area is very, they they they're they're familiar with things like this. And and looking at uh, your proposal and and your map, I would, you know, as far as the highway divides this part of Mount Uniac to the main part, this is the area that was traded off a long time ago to Halifax Water for their watershed. Otherwise, Mount Uniac would be probably three times the size because there's lots of beautiful lakes in there that people would have loved to live on. Um, so I, I don't see you having an, having an issue with any residential backing up because they'd have to build across the highway. And right now, there's just none of that in there because you have, uh, I, I see in your presentation, you mentioned uh, natural resources and renewables and Elmsdale Lumber and, and there's ongoing logging studies and, and different mm -hmm. things happening in that area. The, uh, to go along with what Councillor Hebb said, like, like the biggest thing is um, a lot of the times because the main access point for uh, th those lands is from Hammonds Plains, that's the main road going into where the watershed is, but there is an access point off the ramp in exit three that brings you in and then one further down off the side of the highway where you can truck up and go and go through, which I'm sure your, your people will be well, well uh, versed with. Um, the, the community aspect is, 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 is the thing that's, that's big, is understanding how that's going to be, and, and also the consultation, because 
I don't think you're going to have many people complain about about noise because they can't hear the lump, the, the, the harvesting that's going on over there. They're not going to hear these. If you go further down the 101, you see it in the distance and on the, and on the ridge line, other wind projects mm -hmm. that are already there. So this would kind of just flow kind of basically from exit three, all the way down to Windsor, you see different, uh, wind farms along the way. The, the, the biggest thing would be, I would ask is just remember the community Mount UNIAC and the consultation. Um, you mentioned it in your presentation, but it wasn't written down. Uh, a lot of it was talked about Hammond's Plains and, and things like that. There, uh, if you, a, a lesson that could be learned from Halifax Water is, is uh, it's better to talk, talk to Mount Uniac earlier on than, than, than later because people, there's certain people get upset if they feel they've been, they've been left out. But uh, mm -hmm. I don't, uh, I'm, I'm interested to see how this uh, moves forward. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. The uh, turbines there in the water supply, that's a project we built some years ago in conjunction with the. And yes, Mount Uniac, I can say that I was out to Muniac today. I was out last week too, but I was out today. And uh, uh, we have brochures here describing, and I'll leave some here for each councillor and some others at your front desk for if one of your residents, for whatever reason, doesn't have one or has questions. But uh, uh, Drop them off the post office, wanted to be mailed to each person along number one highway there. Now, I didn't go inland a ways. I thought if, in fact, there's a visibility issue, it'll be uh, for those people. And yes, in response to your comment about the access here uh, in the East Hans area, uh, we have looked at this coming in off the St. Croix exit, that road that runs parallel and then going, going south onto the project site. That is a site very much under uh, review as opposed to uh, uh, accessing it up through, up through Hammond's Plains and up through the watershed water reserve. Probably not going to use that route, but that's me talking today. Once we look at it more closely, we'll see. But it's either going to be this road or one road, uh, the old Bowwater Road off the uh, head of Samaritan's Bay. Tentative test today. Councillor Eisner. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the government says uh, in 2030 we'll be at 80% renewable. What's the other source of renewable we're doing besides hydro, water? Solar. And how much, what percentage do you think we're at right now? Well, we're, we're around the 40% right now. And uh, as you know, the Muskrat Falls is a very large issue for a host of reasons. And that uh, electricity from there is to be imported, imported into Nova yeah. Scotia, sort of thing. So by uh, 2030, uh, the government's mandated to be, in very large part, approaching 100%. And, uh, and we'll be weaned off a of pole. The coal has to go uh, by 2030. Eight years. I know. <laughs> and, uh, and, and the issue with uh, Atlantic Loop, uh, the premiers met yesterday and the last few days, and, and the prospect of the Atlantic Loop, you know, from Muskrat Falls down through Quebec and down through Newfoundland and coming over, going through the three maritime provinces here. Uh, from a construction standpoint, totally apart from the political side, uh, that may very well be a challenge also. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Councillor Eisner. Seeing no one else, I thank you for your time today and your presentation. Look forward to uh, hearing more on this as we move forward. Well, we hope you do. Uh, we'll, we can answer that question yeah. in uh, June or so, and I hope it's not 20 megawatts. <laughs> anyway, thank you for your time. Thank, thank you. you, sir. Good day. Good enough. Okay, next up we have Greg Burke, first reading of amendments and initial consideration of a development agreement. Rachel.
Thank you, Mr. Chair. So the subject property is located at 541 and 543 on Highway 2 in Elmsdale. The, despite there being two civic addresses, it is just the one property, which is outlined in yellow. Uh, the property is designated and zoned mixed-use center. You can see to the rear of the See my pointer to the rear of the property. We have some high-risk uh, high floodplain zone. This is this color, and then this hatched area is moderate-risk floodplain. So there is a very small area to the rear that is um, floodplain zoning, and this is the CN rail line just here. Uh, there are some existing buildings on the property. The applicant is planning to replace the smaller two buildings at a later date during phase two of the plans. Uh, there are currently five commercial tenants, including an existing self-storage use. So you can see from the aerial photography here, this is the building which will be retained. And there's a couple of small buildings just here. Uh, the purpose of the application is to enable new self-storage buildings on the rear portion of the property, which are not per permitted in the mixed-use center zone. The applicant has indicated that they are considering a mixed-use building as part of phase two. Um, and that will require the demolition of these buildings up here. Uh, so the mixed-use building will be permitted as of right in the mixed-use center zone, but the proposed design, as it's been submitted, doesn't meet the design requirements for the zone, and the applicant's been notified of that and given some comments um, on how they can kind of design the building so that it complies with those design standards. Um, and some comments have been provided to the applicant on the self-storage use to the rear of the building, just based on the design of those uh, buildings. So here's the initial submission plan. Um, as I mentioned, the applicant's working on this right now to look at some potential amendments. The, these buildings out here are the self-storage units. And this building here is the phase two mixed-use building. And the plans submitted to date show two stories. The, 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 the first floor would be commercial, three units commercial. And they are, at this point, proposing six units residential above. Uh, you can see there are two current driveways into the property. There's one here and one here that comes behind this existing building. So the mixed-use center designation zone is to allow for a diverse mixture of medium-density commercial businesses and residential uses in an environment serving both pedestrian and vehicle needs with an aesthetically pleasing, socially interactive streetscape. Um, and self-storage uses don't fit within the intent of that designation and zone. They are a use which is not aesthetically pleasing and doesn't create a socially interactive streetscape. So this use doesn't meet the goal of fostering a consistent walkable, medium-scale growth pattern. So staff have concerns about introducing a new self-storage facility in the mixed-use center's designation and zone. However, um, the, the, property, the area of the property that's been proposed is uh, to the rear of the property, and it does... Um, have its share its boundary with the CN rail line. Uh, so there is an opportunity to enable the development, which staff consider not compatible with the designation zone of the mixed use center, but it won't, staff feel that it won't compromise the ability of the property to have a mixed use compatible use fronting onto highway number two. So based on uh, the initial submission by the applicant, they had requested to redesignate and rezone the real portion of the property. But the, the concerns with this would be um, that would be no control over the type of use or development and its compatibility with the surrounding mixed use center properties. So in the mixed use center, this allows for townhouses and um, multiplexes and mixed use buildings. So some of those uses um, are not uh, necessarily compatible with those use, the mixed use center zone uses. So staff highly recommend that if uh, planning advisory committee and council are minded to consider the highway commercial and self-storage uses through the development agreement, that evaluation policies be included in the amendments. So I've drafted some policies uh, consideration uh, to consider a development agreement of uh, highway commercial zone uses and self-storage uses. Uh, so the, I'll just run through them very quickly. The property must share a real property boundary with the CN rail line. So this would mean that Property, mixed use center properties on the other side of Highway 2 would not be um, part of the, the policy changes. Uh, a minimum of half of the lot depth or 50 meters, whichever is greater, shall be retained for the mixed use center zone uses. 
and the proposed highway commercial zone uses and stealth storage uses will not be considered on the front half of the lot, which is adjacent to Highway 2. So what this does, it makes sure that there is a, an area of the property up front which will still, um, which will still allow for a mixed-use centre zone use adjacent to Highway Number 2. Any related uses, including parking for the highway commercial zone uses or the self-storage uses, shall only be provided in the rear portion of the lot. So this means that the highway commercial use or the self-storage use has to be entirely in the rear portion of the lot. In addition to the lot depth requirements, a minimum lot area of 900 meters squared shall be retained for mixed-use center zone uses. So in the land use bylaw, this is the required minimum lot size um, for a mixed-use center zone uh, property. So not only will they have to um, have the minimum lot depth, they also have to comply with that 900 meters squared. The maximum commercial height shall be in accordance with the height requirements for the highway commercial zone, and that's currently set at 11 meters. A, a screening shall be provided between the area retained for mixed-use center zone uses and the area proposed for the highway commercial zone and self-storage uses, so that there is a visual um, separation between the front of the property and the rear of the property. And also, incompatible uses in the mixed-use center zone will not be um, to the mixed-use center zone will not be considered. And some of these include dog daycare uses, forestry uses and structures, and waste management, recycling, depot uses. So this allows council to look at the proposed use um, requested through development agreement and whether that uh, is a compatible use to the mixed use center zone. So those are just some uh, the draft policies, this, the policy um, that staff are recommending first reading for. Uh, so this here just shows based on the policy and analysis of which properties um, could realistically um, apply for a development agreement through these policies and that this the yellow line here identifies them I think this one here really is uh, this is um, this is high uh, high risk floodplain zoning so this would actually be fairly restricted in the ability to use the rear portion but the rest would have the ability to apply for a development agreement so the drafting of the de development agreements in consideration by PAC and council uh, can be run concurrently with amendments to the Municipal Planning Strategy and Land Use Bylaw, but cannot be given final approval until any amendments are in place to enable the development agreement. So this would mean that at the public hearing, Council could give approval to the amendments and approval to the development agreements at the same public hearing, subject to the amendments being approved by the province. So staff are aware that this has caused some concern in the past and suggest that this is, is, if this is still a concern, that a couple of alternative approaches could be taken and two alternative motions have been drafted. And the first one would be organize a public hearing for the municipal planning strategy and land use bylaw amendments, plus the development agreement for the same evening, but these two items be separated out so they're discussed and voted on separately. And the second alternative motion would be to hold a public hearing for the amendments. And then if the amendments are approved by the province, a second public hearing be scheduled for the development agreement. So this creates a longer process for the applicant and would also cost more to process as there would be two public hearings. However, it does also mean that there would, there would be a separate evening to discuss the two aspects of the application. So citizen engagement, a public information was held on February the 1st and at the PIM, the applicant mentioned they have an existing self-storage business on the property and that these units are for all, all the time. Uh, they feel that as the community grows, that the expanded use would help to provide more storage op options. Uh, the applicant also indicated that it would enable them to clean up the lot. Uh, the second phase is for a mixed use development and that they feel that this would be good for the community. Uh, members of the public were given an opportunity to ask questions or comments or make comments and no questions or comments were received. Uh, following first reading of the proposed amendments, a questionnaire will be mailed to owners of property within 300 meters of the application site and staff suggest that any properties outside of the 300 meters but within the mixed use center zone adjacent to the CN rail line also be mailed a questionnaire. So although there are a number of mixed use center zone properties adjacent to the C CN rail line and when you measure the 300 meters from the application property it doesn't include all of those properties. So staff are suggesting that all of those properties be included in the questionnaire mail out. And uh, conclu to conclude, uh, to enable the applicant to continue with their application, 
amendments are required to the municipal planning strategy and land use bylaw. Uh, if approved, these amendments would also apply to other properties in the mixed use centre zone. The amendments are not appealable to utility and review board and a draft development agreement will be presented with the final staff report. Uh, but this cannot be given final approval until amendments are in place which enable the development agreement. So um, this uh, flow chart just shows that we're at the stage of first reading of the amendments. Those are the two alternative motions that have been drafted, as already mentioned. The recommendation is that first reading be given to the Municipal Plan Strategy and Land Use Bylaw Amendments, initial consideration to enter into a development agreement, and that authorization be given to schedule a public hearing. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Rachel. Councillor Garden Cole. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So this is in my, uh, my area, my district, and uh, I do have some concerns. The area zoning does not permit this. First of all, the front part of the application it looks great, uh, and I'm uh, totally in favor of that. But the back part, which is uh, proposing self-storage units, um, is not currently uh, acceptable in this zoning. Um, it's not what we want for this zoning, and, um, and it's not a good fit. Uh, business Park is more where this would belong, although I know they, they have the land and want to do something with it, or, or a more rural area, which we've recently approved for uh, self-storage units. Um, my concern is that if this one is approved, um, I know that there was another self-storage unit application put in not long ago, um, that they may, they may see it as an open opportunity for someone else. And I, I really don't think that along there in that zoning is where we want to have self-storage units start to be building up. Definitely not what we're going for. Um, as well, uh, my obvious concern would be this uh, zoning is currently under review. So that's a big thing for us to be starting to look at development agreements on a zoning that's not permitting something when we're actually under a review for this zoning in general, I would think would be something that we don't want to get into at this time. Uh, development along, um, and when talking about uh, not being suitable for other uses in that back area of the, uh, along the railroad tracks, uh, John Murray Drive has had numerous developments that are backing right on the railroad tracks in Enfield in the same district. So I'm thinking that, uh, you know, maybe there is something more that they could be developing back there other than uh, something that's not permitted in the zoning. So those are just my thoughts on it. Uh, but thinking that, you know, it's not permitted and we should not be entering into a, a development agreement on an area that is under review right now for the zoning. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Deputy Warden Mitchell. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, a couple questions. Uh, you mentioned screening. Uh, could you uh, elaborate on the screening part? So that would mean that, uh, sorry, through me, you, Mr. Chair, that would mean that the they would be look we would be looking at providing some screening between the two uses. So that could be fencing, it could be hedges or some kind of visual screening. So you create kind of a visual break between the two uses. Uh, but that would be negotiated through a development agreement and uh, what made sense with that use at that time. Okay. The second one uh, is looking at the alternative motion one. Uh, is the province involved in that motion? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, the province would be involved in all of the motions, uh, but what this means is that when you, uh, when you go to a public hearing, instead of it all being in the script, you're talking about the application as a whole, you're actually separating out the amendments and then you're considering the development agreement and, and, and having that separated out. But the province in all of these motions, this, these two and, the, and the, the one staff are recommending, the province are involved. Oh, so would the province be uh, receive those amendments before the development agreement? Uh, through Mr. Chair, so the only one where you council would get to um, to decide on the development agreement after the province have reviewed that would be alternative motion two. So there'd be two public hearings. Yeah. If council approved the amendments, those amendments would go to the province. 
province would decide whether those have been approved. Then, council, uh, then staff would bring another report back to Planning Advisory Committee and Council um, with the, uh, the amendments in place and requesting the development agreement be considered. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Deputy Warden. Councillor Musa. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I 100% agree with uh, Councillor Gardner Cole. Like, we, we sp staff spend many, many, many hours developing a plan, and every every meeting we have somebody that want to insert something in the rural use, sometimes in the MC zone. So, so we have a plan. We have, we, we work hard for it, and I think we should st stick with it. If you if we have if you want storage, there's a place for storage. If you have, if you want apartment buildings, there's a place for. But my question too is, if we approve this one, if the if the property next door try to do the same thing and we refuse it, that is going to be appealable because it's allowed. It's, it's is it appealable or not? Sorry, Mr. Chair, yes, if these amendments are approved, if someone was to come forward with a request through a development agreement, that would be appealable, yes. And of course, we're going to lose it because we cannot pick and choose which we, who we're going to approve and who okay. we're going to not. So as Councilor Garden called, you might be seeing like a 20 storage facilities next to each other because it's, it's, that's a business that's going on now and we should have spot for it. And it's, it should be away from residential because you cannot have residential and storage on the same place. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Warden Rolston. Thank you. A um, couple of quick questions to staff. I'm looking at the picture of the subject property, the aerial photo. And in that back area, are those vehicles of some type? They look rather large. What are those white things in the backyard? Three, Mr. Chair, I believe they used to store um, travel trailers and RVs on the property. That, like when I went out to visit the property, I don't believe there were any at that point. And I don't know how old this aerial photography is. Mm -hmm. It would probably only be stored there and then late fall, winter, and spring up until the long weekend of May. Um, okay, and what are the uses on the properties either side here? Uh, through Mr. Chair, so there's a number of uses in this property here. Um, I can't recall the tenants. I think this is a, a restaurant out front here, and there were some other kind of highway commercial type uses. This. This is a, a dwelling just here, but it is zoned highway, um, mixed use center, sorry. Uh, so we have a dwelling and this is strides opposite. And there are a mixture of tenants, I believe in this bit, this property here. And what's that track looking thing in the backyard of the next door property? Uh, are we, this area no, here? No, other one. Oh, this? Yeah. I, I, this is a, pri a private property, I'm not sure. What's going on on this one? Okay. Okay, well, thank you. I, um, having heard the area councillor's opinion on this, um, I had initially thought, you know, looked at it and it seemed fairly innocuous, but uh, I am somewhat inclined to. Uh, lean towards supporting her view as she knows the area and she knows the residents and uh, and it was initially some mixed use and staff themselves indicated some reservations about this. Thank you. Thank you, Warden. Councillor Tingley. Uh, just a question uh, through you, through the uh, chair. Uh, have we, have we amended our MPS? Can you give me an example of when we amended the MPS before? Through Mr. Chair, yes, we, we have amended the MPS. There are, there are two types of amendments we generally considered. We, we, we look at amendments that are, amend the designation and the zone, which is actually the next, the next item on the agenda here. And then we also, the council also amend uh, policies to enable an application. Off the top of my head... Well, that's, that's my question, amending the policy. I know we can amend it as zoning, but, you know, uh, changing the, the policy. 
Uh, through Mr. Chair, actually there is one um, in my mind now. There was a recent application by Dr. Sheehy to amend the policies related to the floodplain zoning to allow for existing buildings to be used as something else. Um, so that was recently approved within the last few months by council. So those were amendments to the policies of the municipal plan and strategy. But Mr. Chair, if I could just make one more question, uh, comment. Um, the policies of the municipal plan and strategy set out that if council have discretion as to whether they want to approve amendments to the municipal plan and strategy, if they don't feel it's in the best interest of the municipality, um, that's why they, they don't have to approve it. And that's why there is no um, appeal uh, ability to the utility and review board because it's council's document. And if they don't feel that those policies um, should be amended, then that's that's right there in the documents. Okay. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Perry. Um, in that current district, um, what self-storage options are there? Like, uh, did you guys look and see how many different self-storage options are in that dis district? Through you, Mr. Chair, no, I, we haven't done that assessment, but I do know that the applicant has uh, some self storage uses in their existing building. Um, they have 10 units right now in this this building here, uh, but I haven't done an assessment on what other self storage options are in that community. Okay, no, I just I just know like uh, and I definitely hear what what the council for the area is saying um, that uh, you know uh, it, it might not be aesthetically pleasing for that zone um, the only concern I have is that uh, for a lot of people especially um, in the current situation um, self storage is is one of the things that that is actually at a premium and actually growing a growing need uh, for many different things and it's not just for people with toys it's people downsizing and moving back home with their parents and, and needing to, to find a way to live so uh, I just was wondering what options were in that area and you know Highway 2 in that, that area, we're trying to make it a walkable district. And if we're putting the storage kilometers and kilometers away, it might be unattainable for some of them. So I uh, just wanted to figure out what was available in the area as alternatives for people. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. John, do you want to weigh in there? <clears throat> yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I just wanted to comment, I guess, on amending the MPS in general. Um, we probably do, I'm going to say three, four, maybe even five a year applications that involve an amendment to the FES. Um, in theory, if you've got a good plan, that you should do more applications that don't involve an amendment to your MPS. And it's why you have to do reviews every five or 10 years to update your plan. Um, but it is a living document. And, you know, it's not, um, you should never expect to never have to go back and amend your document between um, updates. So. I guess when we look at an application like this, um, it's almost like a mini review we do, I guess. Like, is would the land use be appropriate at this location? We kind of look at it through that lens. So, um, again, just that, yeah, you should try to do most of your amendments through a, a larger update process. But, again, we, we do this on a, probably a three, four, or five times a year as it is now. Thank you, John. Uh, Warden Rolston. Yeah, and the other concern I have is similar to what others have said. If we make these amendments, that applies, they apply to any mixed use zone that butts up against the railroad. So that's numerous other properties. And as it sits now, when something like this comes along, we have the ability to say, no doesn't fit in the zone, it's, you know, you can't do it. But the minute that we make these amendments, then we, we don't really have that ability. We, we can do a development agreement, which is appealable. And my concern is if we make these amendments for self-storage facilities, then how big a leap is it to amend them so that other things might be allowed in that zone. And I, you know, off the top of my head, I don't know, but more business park industrial type uses to be 
allowed. And I guess I just, I used to get very frustrated here because I felt that it seemed to me, and, and we have fixed the process somewhat, but at one time it seemed that developers were buying properties, knowing what the zoning was, immediately coming in and wanting it rezoned from R1 to R2 or from R2 to R4. And it was a rapid, relatively simple thing to do, and it wasn't always, wasn't very often what people wanted to be done. So we had to tighten up our procedures there. And I guess I look at this as, as somewhat the same. And if, um, if folks want to do something different on a property like this, would there be anything to prevent them from coming in and saying, I would like to have the back part of that property rezoned? And then it would only, I know you don't like spot zoning, but then it would only affect the specific property and the specific instance, instead of changing something that affects other properties. Uh, would, would that be an option? Hey, uh, through you, Mr. Chair, that is an option. Um, staff were concerned about that option because once you rezone it, that whole uh, list of uses within that zone is open for the applicant to come in and, and do as of right. Um, so, so yes, it is an option, and yes, you are just dealing with one property, but it does open the door for a number of other uses which may not be compatible with that area. Thank you. I guess I'm still, as I, although I do understand, as Councillor Perry says, we are in need of, of self-storage in the municipality as a whole, but, uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Warden. Councillor Garden Cole. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, through you, we have to realize that um, District 1 is very, it's a small district, but it's very close to Elmsdale, which does have, uh, you know, it's very concentrated there, that area, and it's very close to Elmsdale, which has sea storage uh, units in the Elmsdale Business Park, which is where, you know, ideally where we want that kind of development. Um, and, and as I say, with us under review in that zoning and the possibility of, of getting self-storage in there and then getting more self-storage applications in there, it just really, to me, it just is, is not a good fit. As much as I do like the, the front part of their application, I just think that, I think that if they look, they will see or they will be able to find something that can go on the back part of their application, uh, back part of their development other than a self-storage unit. Um, you know, as they've done down by the railroad tracks, as I said before, down in Enfield, uh, just, I just don't, uh, just don't see it being a good fit. And I would hate to set the precedent for, uh, that to build up that way along there. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Warden Rolston. And just re-looking at this plan, you know, the possibility exists that some of these folks moving here wanting to store stuff could have commercial moving vans, tractor trailer sized, hired to move their things. And I'm not seeing good turning radius and such there to get a tractor trailer in and out of there. Or even, you know, it might be challenging for a very large U-Haul to get maneuvered around and turned around in there. So I'm not sure space-wise that, that there's really enough room for everything that's uh, proposed because with this number of storage units, you know, you have somebody here with a little U-Haul unloading stuff and you have a tractor trailer come in to fill a couple of them down here and that truck could very easily be trapped in there till this truck gets loaded or unloaded and there's no room around the back to turn and go back out and looking at the entrance and the exit I don't think there's even room to come down and go through the middle and go back out for anything of any length, which then begs the purpose of what if there's a fire in that storage unit and you're trying to get fire trucks and water in and out of there. So that does cause me some concern as well. Mr. Chair, can I just address that 
point quickly. Um, so staff have made some comments to the applicant on that, that area of the site, and what, that was one of the things, the truck turning was one of the things that we had addressed. I don't know if, if Council uh, Planning Advisory Committee remember the Troy Matheson application where we had a truck turning template and you could see the movement of the vehicle around the site. So staff have requested that information from the applicant and that may um, or is likely to require some um, adjustments to the property uh, proposed application to allow for those vehicles to move through the property. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. All right, seeing no one else, what would your wishes be? Are you interested in one of the options or are you interested in Deputy Warden Mitchell? Uh, I'll move the recommended motion. Remover, do we have a seconder? Do we have a seconder? Third call for somebody to second the motion. Motion is lost. Do we need a motion, John, if they're not going to do this to... Um, am I right in thinking that you to, should to have To you, one? Mr. Chair, it would be better, I think, to have a motion cleaner, to recommend to Council what you're going to do with it. Yeah. If there is no motion, then we would call it a deemed refusal and okay. let the applicant know that way. But yeah, I think it's always better to have a motion to state your intent. Anyone prepared to make a motion? Councillor Perry. I'll move that, that the Planning Advisory, Planning Advisory Committee recommends to Council that this has been, I forget what the word it was. Refused. Used, has been refused by committee. Do we have a seconder? Seconded by Councillor Musa. Any discussion on the motion? Looking for the question. Questions been called, we'll go to the vote. And the motion has passed with, as soon as I can get in to see who voted against it. Councillor Hebb voting nay, Councillor Mitchell voting nay, and Councillor Eisner voting nay. Okay, so. Okay, next on the agenda is Scott Bloyce, initial report for rezoning and redesignation to Village Core. Rachel. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. So the applicant proposes to change the designation and change the zone from established residential zone um, designation to village core designation and um, from two unit dwelling residential zone to village core. So essentially changing it from what is a two unit dwelling property to a village core property. And you can see the subject property outlined in yellow there, it does have frontage on Highway 214, and it's adjacent to the old Elmsdale School property. You can see here the aerial photography. There is an existing building on there, um, which is a, it's residential right now. Um, so you have residential to the side, um, and then the Elmsdale School property, and then there is um, the properties opposite, a zoned village core. So there is a, a mixture of residential, institutional, and village core zone properties. And when we look at a five minute walk, which I believe is 500 um, meters uh, from the application property, you have a variety of uses, but the majority of the properties on highway number 214 um, is uh, our village core. Um, these are two properties uh, located off Highway 214 um, on separate uh, streets. So the applicant has submitted a concept for the site. Um, they're still working on what they are looking at for the site and that um, as, as of now, this, it, this building is likely to be reduced in size as it's over what would be permitted as of right. So if they were to go forward with this building, 
um, they would need to go through a development agreement for the for the proposed um, for the proposed use. But the building shows commercial on the the, the first floor and residential units above. Um, so we'll see what the applicant kind of comes up with. But um, through as of right developments, the applicants can build up to 835 meters squared for um, a building that has more than one use. So the, these are the policies that enable council to review this application. And UD1 and UD2 allows for a diverse mixture of retail, service, business, and residential uses in an environmental environment serving both pedestrian and vehicle needs. And these policies are specific to the village core designation and zone. I am 10 and I am 12 is in the implementation section of the municipal plan and strategy. And the I am 10 allows council to consider amendments to the MPS where they feel the change is in the best interest of the municipality. And I am 12 allows council to consider map amendments to the MPS that are consistent with the intent of the strategy, but not cons consistent with the strategy's maps. So this is just the initial report. Um, regarding this application and a public information meeting is required for the application. So if that moves on um, past this stage, then the next stage will be public information meeting. Then first reading, questionnaires be sent to property owners within 300 meters of the application site. And then um, comments from requested and internal departments and external agencies. And then finally, uh, uh, the final staff report. So staff will continue to review the application by Scott Blois. And this initial report simply outlines the development proposal and further reports will consider traffic, design, and other planning matters. Staff are recommending that a public information meeting to be held as the next step in the process as um, uh, amendments to the municipal plan strategy require the PIM to be held. And just also to re remind PAC that amendments to the MPS are not appealable to utility and review board. And the recommendation is that um, staff be authorized to schedule a public information meeting. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Rachel. Warden Rolston. Thank you. So this property is currently R2. Correct, yes. And there's a single unit dwelling on it? That's correct, yes. So R2 would allow only one more dwelling on this property? Yes. And, okay, is it subdividable to somehow allow more? Uh, I, through Mr. Chair, I haven't, uh, I haven't done the analysis on, on that yet, but okay. just looking at it, I would say that you could subdivide to have another, so, so create two units on there, but I don't believe you could subdivide any smaller than that. So correct me if I'm remembering wrong, and I may be, but... Do we not have some kind of an allowance for Village Core, where they have commercial on the ground floor and residential above, that if they are unable to fill the commercial space, that after a certain time it's allowed to flip over to residential? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. So the policy, the regulations actually allow them to have um, residentials right from the start. Um, on the on the ground floor and residential above. What they do have to do though is they have to make that that first floor commercial ready. So they have to have a certain height of um, uh, from from floor to ceiling and windows um, on the front of the elevation, so that if someone comes along at a later date and wants to convert to commercial, they are able to do that. But they're not required to go straight in with the commercial. They have they can build. Um, residentials from the get-go. So if we approve this rezoning and redesignation, then should the business climate change, then, or the developer, you know, for whatever reason, sell to another developer or something, there could simply be apartment buildings put in there. That's correct, yes. And how many, how high, how many? Just <clears throat> 
just put a cork through it. Down by the old Elmsdale school and the Irving. They're all there, number two. Mm -hmm. Or the 214, I mean. So through Mr. Chair, the, as of right, the property owner can have multiple unit dwellings with a minimum of eight dwelling units to a maximum of 12 dwelling units. I'm just going to check and see how many buildings they are all actually allowed to have. There. Is that the current zoning or if it were rezoned? The, the, the proposed zone, the village core. Yeah. So through you, Mr. Chair, it looks like the um, if they want to go beyond 12 dwelling units, um, they would have to go through a development agreement. So they're allowed between 8 and 12 dwelling units as of right. And the, the development property. agreement could increase that? Yes. So if we rezone this property, all of a sudden we're gone from R2 to a 12 unit apartment building being able to be slotted in there as of right and the possibility of more. Um, but to me, but, but I find that a little concerning, but I'll wait to hear from other members of council as to how they see it. Thank you. Thank you, Warden. Councillor Musa. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, looking at the map, I think this. This property has been left out of the village core zone. I don't know how it happened, but I think it's it's a, it's kind of a mistake because it had the frontage on a highway two fourteen. It it's bigger than the minimum size. I see two other property left out or three, but probably they have they don't have the frontage or too small to be smaller than seven thousand square feet. But I don't understand how this was left out from. I don't know if somebody can explain to me. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, I, I don't know if the director can shed any light on that. Um, through you, Mr. Chair, I think just because it, it backed onto Brook Court, um, I don't know that a whole lot of thought went into um, putting into Village Court when Village Court was extended up that far. Uh, I don't remember any conversations about it anyway. Yeah, but it's looked, it's looked to me like it was missed. Missed, uh, I don't know if it looked the same to you, but it had all the all the size requirement and the frontage that it need to be village core, and it's the only one that's big enough to be, and it's not there. So I, I think, to be fair, it should be it should be done right. Thank you. That's all, Councillor. Yes. Okay. Seeing no one else, is anyone prepared to move the recommendation? Councillor Tingley. Moved by Councillor Tingley, seconded by Councillor Musa. Recommend this to go forward to a public information meeting. Councillor Garden Cole. Good Sorry. Motion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Can you just bring up the recommended motion? So this just schedules the public information meeting on it. We're not tied to change it or anything. Thank you. Warden Rolston. Now, I'll, I will speak in support of the motion to go to a PIM because I will be very interested in hearing what the surrounding residents think about this. Thank you. Seeing no one else be looking for the question. Question. Question's been called. We'll go to the vote. And the motion has passed unanimously. That concludes the business of PAC. I'll be looking for a motion to adjourn to infrastructure and operations. Moved. Moved. We have a seconder. Second. Seconded. All in favor? We stand adjourned from PAC. Well, didn't have to stand up because I'm moving Elden, but thank you. I appreciate that. Okay. <laughs>
We could trade and I could school them on sewers. Okay. So okay. So that's the reason I'm asking. Okay. Sounds good. Fifteen. <laughs> <15? laughs> Can we go too? <laughs> I thought he's asking, is the chair gonna break? <laughs> Folks, we're, we are scheduled for a break. My apologies. We missed that in the agenda. We're going to break at this time for 10 minutes to reconvene at 2.56.
We're going to call our infrastructure and operation meeting to order. The first item is the approval of the minute of January 18, 2022. Move and second. All in favor? Aye. Motion passed. Okay. Our next item is winter, winter road efficiency. Fred. Okay. Uh, further to council motion C21290, staff are requested to provide a report of municipal road ownership efficiency. And as directed, the primary focus was specifically to review winter clearing respect to who cleared what roads. And then uh, as all of you have read the report, I'll just skip to the alternatives. And if there's any clarification, I'll be happy to give that. Uh, alternative one, continue to con contract out and manage within road within a road exchange of the province based on efficiency, cost effectiveness. Two, continue to contract out and manage within a road exchange with the province. Uh, contract work to the province and build in-house capacity to provide service. Right. And the recommendation was not to change current program and approach until such time as road ownership between the municipal and province change is uh, spread out and basically, we're near five of our road maintenance contract anyway, so that's our recommendation. Okay. I don't see, I don't see anybody looking to speak. Okay. Now we have Councillor Perry. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Through, through your staff, this is just a point. I know uh, at the beginning of the snow season, there was a few municipal roads out Mount Uniac that were part of the trade program. Correct. And uh, they were not plowed at all. Department yeah. of Highways did not honor their side. They did not plow it out. We had the big freeze. Okay. Residents were up in arms. Mm -hmm. uh, phone calls were made. And then shortly after that, I will say the service level returned to an acceptable level. And they were they were kept pretty good for the rest of the winter. So okay. I, I wanted to say kudos to staff for taking those complaints from the residents and pushing it forward and rectifying the situation for them. Because I know... There was a couple roads there that were almost impassable for a while because yes. the snow came down, the rain, and it froze, and it took weeks and weeks of it being beaten down to get back to a passable level. Yeah. It was quite a winter, yes. For yeah. that. So I, I just want to say thank you to staff that when right. when some of these agreements do kind of go by the wayside, uh, they were very quick to react, and I just want to say right. thank you for that. Yeah, I'll pass it on. Is that all, Councilor? That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next is Warden. I would move staff's recommend recommendation, which is to not change the programming approach until such time as road ownerships between the municipality and province change to a less spread out and complex governance model. Second. Move and second. I have uh, Deputy Warden. Thank you, Mr. Chair. During the winter season, I had some emails or comments from people that the snow was pushed into the ditch and the ditch got full and the water wouldn't flow. Mm -hmm. So my suggestion was to them to uh, just try to dig out the end of the culvert to let the water flow. Uh, I'm assuming you got some calls too because they said they had yeah. called staff with their complaints. but. Yeah. I was very pleased with the last snowfall that they just plowed the paved area of Elmwood and the ditches stayed more open and we had no water issues uh, after yeah, the last storm. Right. So thank them on, on our behalf. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Deputy Warden. Uh, I have a question, so I'm gonna pass the chair to the warden. Uh, okay, yeah, as, as of now, I like, I don't know about the corridor, but in Mount Uniac, it's only winter clearing that we have with the province, right? Or, Correct. Yeah. Okay. So, have you ever, have we ever tried to engage? Now, I know probably in the, in the past we didn't have many contractors in Mount Uniac, but as of now, I know there is few of them, and they're taking on private road, and they're doing more than excellent job, I could say. Right. And I, I don't know if it's too hard to do something like that to engage like contractor from the area to take over because we have significant and it's they're coming every year now mm. uh, i don't see it 
doing uh, done like this year or next year. But I, I would like us to look into into the future to to be able to engage like some contractor from Mount Uniac or yeah. Rodden area or whatever yeah. area we needed, yeah. uh, and see what where their price range is and. We probably get them cheaper than the pros. I don't know, but I think we should look at it. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a good thought. That's something we're considering at the end of the current contract, just to see who's out there and interested. Whether we break it down, it'd still be a fit more efficient to bring everything together. But that would be an option for areas outside of the core. Right? Okay, thank you. Okay. I'll take the chair back. Okay, we have Councillor Eisner. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to tell you that uh, the residents at Basin were happy to see them back. Okay, good. That's all you said. <laughs> thank you. That's all, Councillor. Okay, see no one left. Question. Uh, question. question being called. Let's go to the vote. And the vote are all in, and it passed unanimously. Okay. Our second, our next item is solid waste tipping fee policy, Andrea. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So um, I'm here to report on our solid waste tipping fee schedule for um, April 1st, 2022. Um, staff uh, have put the report in for you. Typically, we have a five-year tipping fee um, policy. We are re recommending a two-year policy. Um, as we've previously reported, there are a number of changes coming for solid waste um, in Nova Scotia, and so we wanted to be... Um, cautious on, on setting some, some fee schedules. Um, so within the report, staff are recommending uh, a 2 to 3% increase annually uh, based on the material type and the schedules within the report. Um, this is uh, aligning with what our current uh, policy is. Um, so I guess I can answer any questions on it. And then we have two uh, recommended motions there. Okay, I see no one have any questions, so. Warden. I move that the Infrastructure and Operations Committee recommend the Council give notice of intent to adopt the proposed amendments to the Solid Waste Tipping Fee Council Policy as attached to the Executive Committee agenda date of March 22, 2022, which includes a rate increase of 2 to 3% annually based on material type. Is that just for the policy meeting? At the council, after the meeting? That's to send it to the policy meeting. <coughs> yeah. Second. Move and second. Any question? Question. Question being called. Uh, I, yeah, I see what you're saying, sort of. Accomplishes the same thing to send it to council. Uh, Deputy Warden Mitchell is up to speak. Oh. Hello. Just a quick question on the set of fees on uh, t a material type. Does that mean 2 to 3% on all materials or just certain ones? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, so each material type, um, some are 2% and some are 3% depending upon the material type. So we have a number of materials in there. So essentially we're going to um, follow the current um, increase that we've been doing the last five years for each of those material types. So if it was 2%, it would be 2% again, or if it's been 3%, it would be 3% for okay. each of the individual items. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You're welcome. <clears throat> See you no more. There's two more people to vote. Did we do the vote? Oh, yeah, whoever didn't vote. I'm I didn't vote because I was asking questions. We've reset the vote, folks. Thank you. 
and it passed unanimously. Our next item is update on operational impact from winter weather events. Yes, he's not here. No. Kim. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Jesse wasn't able to join us today. Uh, so um, I'm going to present this report to you. If Shirley could maybe bring it up on the screen. Uh, Fred is in the room if you have any questions, um, but Jesse and I have certainly discussed all of these issues at length, um, and we've had some discussions with Council as well on uh, sort of the operational impact on some of our weather events that we've had uh, this winter. This report is operational in nature and, and sort of an information report for Council on what we are um, have been dealing with, which hopefully is over now. Um, we've had all of our freezes and thaws and... Um, floods and whatnot. Certainly some significant weather patterns this past few months, uh, which has uh, resulted in a number of calls, um, an exponential number of calls to the municipality and certainly complaints through councillors. So we just wanted to put this uh, uh, report together as information for council. It's got some of the weather events that have happened sort of so you get an idea of all the, the ups and downs. Um, talks a little bit about flooding and what the municipal response is to um, flooding in our storm systems as well as flooding on private property and the requirement uh, or the advice that we would give folks that every residential property should have a backflow prevention device installed. Um, we do have intent this summer to put together some sort of pre-winter uh, communication and um, provide homeowners with some assistance on how to get to that next step of, of home protection. Um, it is an individual's responsibility to take that next step. The municipality isn't responsible to do that, but we can certainly help people along the way. So we certainly recognize the need for that after the extensive uh, amount of events this past year. Um, around call volumes, uh, there is some data in the report on the number of calls we've received. Um, from that, what we had in the works or in the plan uh, was to do some online reporting and whatnot for municipal services and issues management. That has been uh, sped up in our plan because uh, you know we want to try and avoid what we had this year was uh, sort of accepting information from random ways from the public. Uh, we want to make sure that we can capture that information and manage it better. Uh, so we've started looking at um, internally our processes around call management and issue management, and we'll be working through uh, that in the next few months to make sure that we have sort of one source of the truth for folks as they uh, try and get in contact with us. Some of that has just changed how we communicate our telephone numbers. Um, you know, something as, as simple as before we had, it was called the emergency line. Um, well, we're not available to help people in their individual emergencies, which is what people tended to think when they saw that number. So, uh, you know, we've rebranded that to the after hours and weekends line uh, because that is essentially what it is. It's, it's to receive information uh, from that calling service after hours for folks. And just to look at different ways that we can standardize things. So instead of, you know, uh, Fred, why not at easthands.ca? We've moved to roads at easthands.ca, water at easthands.ca, that type of thing. So those emails will go to folks regardless of who's in the office and who's out. Uh, somebody will always be available to, to take those emails to make sure that we're consistently responding um, to customers. Um, so that is the report. Um, we we think it's important that Council understand this was an anomaly of a year, uh, but we also need to prepare for this to happen again, obviously. Um, and I think it's important that you know that these things are be not just being brushed aside as, well, it happened and we'll move on. Um, our job is to enhance the public trust in what we do, and part of that is how customers and how the public is responded to when they contact this office. So. 
Um, we hope to tackle some of those challenges of awareness and how people can be more prepared themselves. And we hope to be able to um, improve our service delivery as far as responding to calls consistently um, as they come in based on different, uh, different things that are happening in the community. So Mr. Chairman, I just offer that as a report for information. There is no uh, recommended motion. Okay. Anybody have a question to the CAO? Deputy Ward. Just a quick question through on the report. How did, uh, how did staff react to the comments and calls from the residents? How uh, was their mental health? Uh, uh, through you, Mr. Chairman, uh, staff certainly took a lot of calls over the last few, um, few months. Um, and they are difficult calls to take, obviously. You've got people who are sometimes in distress, um, who are looking for assistance that we can't always provide. Uh, so those are hard calls to take. But um, I would like to think that all of the responses I've seen were professional and uh, well-managed and um, not always the answer that people wanted. Uh, but I think that they were always uh, treated with respect and from staff's point of view. That's good. Thanks. Is that all that? I see no one else. So that's it. Uh, Our next item is road snow removal budget. Kim again. That's me again, pitch hitting for Jesse. Um, so, councillors, we're at the point in our year where we have been evaluating budgets and uh, keeping tabs on our snow clearing budgets, and of course, the uh, abnormal winter weather that we've just discussed is going to hit you on your snow clearing budget as well. Um, as you get those freezing above and below, uh, lots of different um, salting, sanding, plowing, uh, different scenarios. Uh, we do have uh, an over an anticipated over expenditure for snow removal this year. Um, the balance in our snow clearing reserve is two hundred eighty-five thousand dollars. That reserve is funded every year by adding to it if we don't spend our snow clearing budget and taking from it if we overspend on the snow clearing budget. So this isn't something unusual, uh, but it's certainly something that we track all throughout the year. So your original budget this year was for $330,000. Uh, we've paid $151,000 to date, and we have another one hundred and seventy-three dollars um, for bills that we've received. Uh, we do have some more of the bills that just arrived today uh, that will be covered by the requested over expenditure and they are within that um, those amounts that we've estimated. So with March not being as severe as January and February to date, uh, we're at day 22 so let's knock on some wood, uh, we're anticipating that an over expenditure of between 80 and $120,000 will be required. Um, so part of that, uh, part of the recommended motion is that if we can absorb that in our year-end surplus, which we anticipate we can, um, then we would do so, but any shortfall from that surplus would be funded from the roads snow clearing operating reserve, which again has the $285,000 set aside for that purpose. Okay, thank you, Kim. Uh, Councilor Perry. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I have to say when I first uh, started skimming this report, I got excited because I said, oh, geez, 330,000, we only had to pay 151. And then I read the next line and <laughs> was not as happy. But it's it's the way things go. It's winter time. We, we live in the maritime. So I'm going to move the recommended motion as presented. Move and second. I have uh, Councillor Gadlin Cole. Just one second. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, through you, I'm just wondering, and you may not know right off the top of your head, so when we, in our budget for next year, did we allow 330000 going forward for next year as well? Or? Sue, can, Sue can answer the actual number. I guess I would say to you that it doesn't really matter <laughs> um, because it, it it's may a be a better winter. Year. Yeah. Um, we, I think we did add some for the new roads that we we've did. added. Um, we budgeted 390000 for next year. Okay, just wondering how that would lay out. Thanks. Thank you, sir. 
Is that all, Councillor? Yes, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, next, Councillor Rhino. Yes, I'll support the motion, but I'm wondering if, and correct me if I'm not asking the right question at the right time, have we ever considered the use of uh, brining and DOA direct liquid application on our roads uh, from our contractors? Uh, what's the discussion around that that would save, you know, on salt usage and salt and, and salt is a dangerous commodity? So uh, I just wondered if somebody at some point could fill me in on have we ever considered using that from our contractors or making? I know there's a cost associated with it, but, you know, have we, have we discussed alternative things to the usage of salt? Uh, three, Mr. Chairman, if Jesse were here, he would love to answer that question for you. Uh, I'm not aware of the answer, um, and I see Fred has gone. So uh, we can certainly, I can ask that question through Jesse to get back to you with. Yeah, I'd, I'd be interested. Yeah, thank you. Is that all, Councillor? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Hepp. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I think it's to the motion. Um, and these snowstorms or salt storms or whatever you want to call them, uh, the bill comes in, is that classified as the hours the machine worked and the amount of salt they use? Is that the way it's built? Okay. And I'm assuming that staff does, but a lot of times uh, is the salt being placed more often than it should? Or, you know, are they going out at a reasonable time? And is that, that stuff is being looked at, I yes, would like absolutely. to think. And, and yeah. you know, because a lot of times if they're, you know, they buy salt at a certain price and they charge us exorbitant price just to lay it on the ground, that, that, uh, that would be a concern to me. But if, they're, if staff feels that they're uh, doing an adequate job and what they're doing, I, I'll, I'll be okay with that. Yeah. Thank you. At three, Mr. Chairman, I know our staff do uh, do their due diligence on the bills that are submitted. Um, and to have a, have a good back and forth with the contractor on our various contracts that we have. Okay, I see no one else want to speak. Question being called. And it passed unanimously. Good job, Ken. Thank you. That will bring us to the end of the Infrastructure and Operation Committee. I'm looking for a mo mo motion to adjourn and break. Back to recreation. Move and second. Back to oh, back to rec and culture. Okay. Moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passed. I think she wants another beer. She's going to get somebody. She wants to go get somebody. Dabber. Just dabber. Yes. Just while we wait for staff to get back to start wrecking culture, just take an opportunity to draw folks' attention to. Uh, this nice little bag you would have found on your desks. Uh, this is a, a sample provided to each councillor of municipally branded items that have recently been purchased for the municipality, and this is a sample for uh, each of us. Just so councillors have and councillor are aware what might be available if there are, you know, any special things going on or whatever that you would like to have a I thought it was a welcome back gift. Something like that. Yeah. 
Or you could consider it a welcome back gift, I guess. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It's a celebration of your new strategic yes, plan. Yes, celebration of the new strategic plan. Ooh, that's so, quite a handle. I know. Welcome back is much quite shorter. <laughs> Anyway, I call this meeting of Parks, Recreation, Culture back to uh, order again, and where we let, we'll pick up where we left off. And I think we are uh, uh, diversity and inclusion strategy. And Mr. President and Ms. Giles, I think you'll be taking that away. So you have the floor just as soon as you get your mics on. There you go. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so today I'll be presenting the Parks, Recreation and Culture Diversity and Inclusion Strategy. Uh, there's three documents that were circulated, the strategy itself, um, the staff report, which I'll be using to guide this presentation, and also uh, the special needs uh, policy dated 1993, which we'll be repealing today, uh, motioning to repeal today. So, quick summary, the PRC Diversity Inclusion Strategy is a set of guiding principles that will shape how recreation programs and services are delivered to residents. This is not a new concept in East Hance. This reaffirms the strategy uh, as outlined in the East Hance Strategic Plan of commitment to increase inclusion and access. In this report, I'll be outlining the PRC Diversity and Inclusion Strategy and we'll explain how it will replace the special needs policy with a more current set of guidelines. The financial impacts from the PRC diversity inclusion strategy will be brought forward through the annual budget process. So there's no immediate financial impact uh, shown with this report today. So a little background. In October 2019, Council approved the Recreation Service Master Plan, which guides municipal staff and Council over five years for decision-making on recreation services within East Hance. The plan outlines a goal to have a safe and inclusive and creative recreation activities available for all East Hance residents. In February 2020, Council adopted the Recreation Access Policy, which aims to reduce financial barriers for adults, youth, and children wish to enroll in municipal recreation programs and services. In May 2021, the Council adopted and approved East Hance Accessibility Plan, Accessible East Hance, which identifies the municipality's commitment to diversity and inclusion. The municipality is also governed by other legislation and policies that support diversity and inclusion, including the Canadian Multiculturalism Act, the Canadian Employment Equity Act, and the Nova Scotia Human Rights Act. PRC staff did not make this uh, inclusion strategy alone. Uh, key, in, key input was used from community members. And the need for inclusive recreation programs was indicated by East Hans residents. Staff consulted with specific residents who faced challenges with East Hans recreation programs. Some residents highlighted that there was just no option available for their child here and actually had to go outside to different municipalities um, to get a program that gave them the one-on-one -on -one support for their programs such as day camp. Oh, sorry. Is that better? Oh, perfect. Sorry about that. Uh, so staff also consulted with our Fundy Regional Rep, um, who is our specialist for inclusion on some of the definitions and best practices related to diversity and inclusion. So in this discussion here, I'll kind of get into the meat and potatoes of the strategy. Um, really, the strategy is designed to assist the department in decision making, um, ensure those decisions are meeting the diverse and inclusive needs of our residents. So we have um, some guiding principles in the strategy document. I'll be going through them here. Um, each guiding principle has an objective and then different example initiatives um, that would be carried out by the PRC department. So programming and services, our first category, and I'll just list these out, to strive and provide adaptive and inclusive recreation programming opportunities for residents, prioritize accessible facilities for municipal programs, workshops, and events, 
utilize the views and ideas of community members and partners for input on recreation programs and services. Spaces and places. Aim to make indoor and outdoor recreation spaces barrier-free. Incorporate the culture and views of underrepresented populations into new and existing recreation assets. Identify and promote accessible recreation spaces within the municipality. Communication and promotion. Use inclusive language. Represent diversity and inclusion in promotional materials. Strive to make communication materials accessible through fonts, contrasts, content, and readability. Meaningful partnerships. Engage underrepresented populations for input and ideas on recreation programs and services. Support our community partners, groups to develop diversity and inclusion-based initiatives. Collaborate with organizations to reduce barriers and strengthen community recreation. Our final category, policy and guidelines. Review and amend existing department policies to contain objectives that contribute towards diversity and inclusion, and when necessary, um, develop new policies uh, that promote diversity and inclusion. So the strategy outlines examples of initiatives, as I said, that will be taken into uh, action upon this uh, framework. Example, inclusive swim lessons or inclusion training for staff. So now I'm gonna speak on the special needs policy um, that was approved by council in 1993. Uh, so this goal of this, uh, the special needs policy, sorry, was, was based on the leisure services goal to provide for the recreational well-being of East Hans residents, the insurance of opportunities to recreate in a wholesome fashion. The intent of this policy was to ensure that leisure opportunities were accessible to East Hans residents whose abilities to partake in recreation services and programs are challenged by one, psychological, two, intellectual, and three, economic factors. The policy aimed to address these issues through human resources, facilities, and also financial supports. Now this policy served these hands well, and I think uh, staff all agreed that, you know, it was very progressive and ahead of its time in doing things and recognizing uh, the need to adapt programs uh, for people with disabilities. Um, but while this served this well, it didn't really give clear guidance to PRC staff on how to be fully inclusive for all residents. So for example, the special needs policy says that in the case where a person has been referred to private lessons, in this context, private swim lessons, the cost for the service will be 50% less than the regular price. And so while this policy offers support to residents with disabilities, financial support, um, it doesn't really give guidance on the type of program that the resident should have. So the PRC diversity inclusion strategy if adopted, would give a guiding principle for the department followed by a clear objective to complete. So I pulled this one here from the actual strategy, which the guiding principle is to make recreation opportunities adaptive and inclusive uh, for residents. The example initiative there would be to offer inclusive swim lessons at the same rate as group lessons. So rather than provide a discount, um, to someone for a private lesson based on their disability would actually design a program, charge the same rate as a group lesson of a swimmer one or two, um, and offer that to the residents. And I will say we, we wrote this report a few months ago and the staff were targeting a spring date for inclusion lessons. We have done that actually, it's, it's been released. Uh, we have 14 uh, residents registered for inclusive spring lessons. Uh, inclusive lessons this spring, starting in April. The municipality has also approved other documents that cover the rest of the areas that the special needs policy was aiming to achieve. For facilities, we now cover this through the East Hans Accessibility Plan, which identifies the municipality's commitment to diversity inclusion in regards to facilities. And of course, in 2020, we adopted the Recreation Access Policy, which aims to reduce financial barriers for adults youth and children who wish to enroll in the municipal recreation programs or services. So to conclude, the PRC diversity and inclusion strategy would be a working document that would guide municipal staff on how to achieve council's goals on increasing inclusion and access 
as outlined in the East Hand Strategic Plan. And of course, as best practices change, we'll continue to adapt to best serve the residents. So the recommendation is that the Parks, Rec and Culture Committee recommend to Council the adoption of the PRC Diversity Inclusion Strategy today, uh, January 2022. And we would repeal the special needs policy dated 93. Of course, the alternative would be um, that you don't adopt the PRC diversity inclusion strategy and provide further input on development standards and final recommendations for strategy. And I'll go up to the motion. Thank you. So we've heard your report. Is there any comment or questions around that? Uh, Councilor Green. I would move the recommended motion. Second. Do we move and second it? Any further comment or question with regard there? I'd just like to, at this time, to turn the chair over to the board. Just the question that I have in my mind is how do we adapt this to, or how does it work around grant applications? Or do we have that built into uh, the uh, applications and how they're scored with regard to inclusion and diversity? Uh, I, just a question, because that's yeah. what jumped out at me. Yeah, uh, thank you, three, Mr. Chair. Um, so the, the idea of this framework is that once it's a lens for parks, rec, and culture, we would apply that uh, and look at that at all of our policies, our grant policies, and see how we could work with uh, community groups to make that a priority um, and review those policies as part of that process. Yeah, I guess where I'm going is that, you know, when we're sitting around and we're scoring, you know, to see if it meets our goals and policies, that that be a consideration and that could give you know, uh, a, a higher award, you know, if that's taking place. And, and that's where I was coming from on that. Yeah. And just to comment again through you, Mr. Chair, I mean, we work with so many community groups, so this really has been a discussion for us because in order to, you know, really see um, the effects of this strategy, we need to work with the community groups, and, and that would have to happen. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Morden. All right, uh, I have uh, Deputy Ward Mitchell to the motion. Yes, uh, just a quick question. I'm hoping it's to the motion. Would this include one-on-one -on -one instruction with staff for resident? That's correct, yeah. Thank you very much. Got all, Deputy? That's all. Seeing no one left to speak, what is your wish? Question. Question has been called on the motion. We'll go to the vote. And the votes are in as passed unanimously. Next order of business would be district recreation funds grants. Uh, Ms. Giles, you'll be taking the lead on that. Yes. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. So this report is bringing forward uh, the DRF intake uh, that closed on January 31st, 2022. So we received seven grant applications and the total funds uh, requesting $65,870. Um, all applications were reviewed by the staff grant committee and evaluated. Um, council may wish to approve funding from district, uh, multiple districts for projects benefit facilities and user facilities that service a large area of the municipality. And you'll notice um, under each project, we'll note um, where other districts have passed, contributed to these projects. Uh, financial impact, um, so available for the DRF fund for this year total is $487,756. In addition, there's 19,822 remaining in the Gore area rate, 114,394 in the Mount Uniac DRF area rate, and $665 in the Shibanaki Community Fund, which was a total of $622,696. 
So again, the total intake uh, requested was 65,870, and the total amount being recommended for approval based on policy is 52,608. So just a little bit of background in DRF for those who might not be familiar um, or need a refresher. Um, the program offers annual funding opportunities to groups that provide benefit to residents of East Hance and provide development of programs, activities, and infrastructure that encourage active and healthy lifestyles. Um, organizations are eligible for 50% of project costs. If the district funds don't have ample funding to meet the request, uh, the organization may receive up to 50% of the district's available funds. However, under special circumstances, council may contribute more than that um, funds that aren't committed yet. All right, so we'll just, here's a um, review of what's available in each district. We'll just leave that up for a sec for you to have a look. Um, included is unused funds, um, the allocation for 22-23, committed funds. Um, so there's some projects that aren't quite finished yet, so that's that column. And you'll notice the Shuby River project committed funds from the motion, um, and then you're available for year to date. So uh, again, we received seven applications. So uh, you'll notice some applications will say complete and some will say incomplete. If they're incomplete, it just means we may be uh, missing some documents. So uh, once we receive everything, it'll be considered complete and we'll release the funding once we really receive all those documents. So I'll just go through each um, by district, each application, and then we can have discussion at the end. Uh, so to start with District 3, there was two applications. Um, there's $21,446 available in the Milford Dunmore River District. So our first application came from Milford Recreation. They're looking to purchase a zero-term zero mower. And in order to house the mower, they need to widen their garage door. So they're requesting the full project amount. Um, um, their application is complete. Uh, they do have additional quotes required and um, they have an OSTAN report for last year's DRF because they haven't completed a project yet. Um, so there, we're recommending 7245000 which is 50% of their project costs as per policy. And of course, we would require projects from last year to be complete in order for them to qualify to get their funding. And in 21-22, uh, Districts 2 and 7 also, also contributed to the projects. Our second application in the district is Nine Mile River Trail Association. They're looking to replace boardwalks along their trail and future trail design. Uh, they're requesting 50% of, of funds, which is $14,282. Um, they are also are incomplete because um, they need to get additional quotes. Um, so DRF recommendation based on policy is 50% of district three allocation, which is 10723 um, In 2020 and 2021, Districts 1, 2, and 7 also, also contribute to this project. Now on to if District... If I may interrupt, do we want to... I'll throw the question out there. Do we want to treat this as a whole, or do we want to do uh, approve these by district? What is your wish? All right, we'll do them as all. Thank you. Okay. Um, so we'll move on to District 6. There's three applications in this district, and there's total available funding of $18,023. Our first um, application is from Hans North Baseball Association. They're looking to get a storage shed for their third field. Um, uh, they're requesting 50% of their funding, which is $1,277. Their application was complete. In 2021, or 2020, 2021, Districts 5 and 11 also contribute to this organization's project. Our second application is from M&M Recreation Association. They're looking to replace their backstop, dug out repair, and they'd like to renovate their bleachers for accessibility. They'd like to put some railings on their bleachers to help um, those who might need a little bit of help to sit to watch, watch ball um, on the bleachers. So they're requesting 50% of their funds, which is 6,843. And we're recommending that as per policy. And in 2020, 2021, District 5 also contributed to, to this project. Oops. 
And then the third application is from the Tennessee Cape Community Club. They're looking to install heat pumps in their hall. Uh, their application's incomplete as they are requiring additional quotes. They're requesting 50% of their funds, which is $5,865. And just a note, they're also applying for the Provincial Community Facilities Improvement Program for this project. Um, and we're recommending the, the requested funds as per policy, um, pending their quotes. And then our next application from District 8, um, there's 73,846 available in this um, pot. Uh, Mount Uniac Mustang Fast Pitch. They're looking to build a storage facility as the facilities they have now are in very disrepair, so they're looking to replace it. Uh, they're requesting 17455 Their application is complete. Um, they currently, we require insurance um, proof uh, for each group for these projects and they didn't have any so they're currently working through those issues which I heard from them yesterday and it looks like uh, that's been resolved um, and their quotes they've also got those so their application would be considered complete. Um, they're also applying for provincial recreation development funding um, so we're recommending 50% funds 14,997. And then our last project from the District 10, there's $41,770 available from E.H. Horn uh, School Preservation Society. They're looking to do flooring upgrades, uh, repair and paint into the exterior concrete of the foundation. Their application is complete and they're requesting 50% of their project costs, which is 5,659. And we're recommending um, their ask based on policy, and in previous years, District 1 has also contributed to these organizations' projects. So here's a summary based on the recommendations, and uh, we can go to discussion. Thank you, Corinne, for the report, and this will be, this is the first round of these, correct? That's right. There'll be another deadline in April. So another deadline will be in April. End of April, yeah. Yeah, okay. Very good. Ah, Board Molson is the first stop. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Regarding the Hans North Baseball Association request, uh, I would be prepared to share a third of that cost. So that would put to four hundred and twenty-six dollars of that amount to come from District Eleven funds. And uh, District Five would take that one third of that as well. actually 425 and change but 426 just, oh, just works you'd like to run up yeah yeah at all or one that's all I don't think we need a motion to do that at this time do we so our motion well we could do we could do it make the suggestions and then uh, vote it on it as a whole yeah. uh, is that your wish then, or we could do these individually. I, I mean, where do you want to go with this? I guess in previous years, we've kind of made the decision and did it as a whole, and then um, when we bring it to council, we outline it in one motion. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure that people change their minds, so that's why I put the question up there. All right, next up, uh, Deputy Warden Mitchell. District 2, we'd like to offer District 3, Diamond River Trails, the balance of $3,559 for their project, since I have quite a few people that use the trail. That's all. Anything further? No, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Warden. Next up would be uh, Councilor Garden Cole. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I was looking at the Nine Mile River Trail Association as well. Um, so that means that they're at their 50% of the 28,563, correct? Correct. And is that where? If council wishes to um, uh, contribute more, they, they can do that. 
I know that myself and Councillor Eisner have contributed to that in the past. Um, well, it's just, it's bordering on, on it, it. Okay, Tom, or Do you want me to go back up to there? Yeah, put it back up there and we'll so have a discussion see. around that because I can see some horse trading going on here. So. <laughs> <laughs> It's all my face. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm in between, so. Yeah, let's, that doesn't seem like well, a, that's good they could a big deal that's of 28. What you can I'd do. like to contribute more than the 50%. Um, so can we just give like a Okay, point? let's have the discussion around the Nine Mile Trails and who wants to contribute and who doesn't. Okay. Garden, Councilor Garden Cole, you have the floor. I do want to contribute. Yes. So can I just contribute a flat rate rather than start going through? Okay, so I'd just like to contribute, let's see what I've got. I'd like to contribute 3,000 to that. Okay, you have that recorded, Ms. Giles? Yes, and I have Janice back there doing calculations for me. <laughs> so you mean, you, you may not get it recorded, right, Janice will? I have it recorded. Right. I just don't know. <laughs> Any, would anybody else like to contribute within the Nine Mile River Trails Association? I'm going to turn it over. I know I'm jumping out of order, but I will, now that we're on this one issue, I'd like to get it going. So I'm going to try to take it to uh, Councillor Eisner. Just I'm trying. I'm trying. Yeah, that's what I'm trying. There you go. Um, yes, I feel we're, we're border Elvin's project there, so I feel we should give, give at least 10,000 for that. We want to get that all the way up. I haven't been asked by anybody since, except for the school system. It's quite a significant donation. Well, I get to walk on it. Get to walk. I don't know, I mean, if I'm not getting requests from the public, Okay, Councillor, or uh, Ms. Giles, do you have that recorded? Ten, do you say 10? Anything else, Council? Anything else would, uh, yeah, on, with, we while we're dealing with the Nine Mile River Trails? You have that my contribution from District 2? You mm -hmm. have that one? The 3,559? Yep. Okay, so does that, does that deal with the Nine Mile River Trails? Very good. You have all that recorded. Very good. All right. Next up, well, everybody disappeared now. Councillor uh, Perry. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for the update, Corinne, for District Eight there. So, so their their application is now complete. Um, the provincial recreation department funding. Uh, they don't receive that. Have they? In, indicated they won't be able to go forward? Uh, no, they haven't uh, indicated that. Okay, because I would, I have enough money. I, I would like to fully fund their, their ask of 17,455. So do you have that now recorded, Ms. Joel? Mm -hmm. Very good. <clears throat> Anything further, Councilor Perry? Uh, no, that's it for now, thank you. Okay, Councillor Musa. Yeah, I would like to contribute a couple of dollars to that. Half, half the amount. You're gonna have to speak up because my hearing aid batteries went off. So I would like to contribute half the amount from District Nine. Of the total project. Yes. So then that would put uh, Councillor Perry's down to half two. Is that? So we're not mixed up here? Okay. Half and half, yeah. Half and half. Okay, you've got that recorded. Is that all, Councillor Musa? And uh, I'll ask the warden to take the chair. Um, can you scroll back up to m and &M? To do. 
I would I would like to put in two thousand of dif district fives to M and M's. Good. Yep. All good. All right. Seeing no one else left to speak, and the uh, the accommodations have all been recorded and verified by Vanna at the back of the room. <laughs> They're not recorded. Okay. They are. Anyway, so is anybody? Oh, Councillor Eisner's back up again. Thank you, Mr. Chairperson. Um, how long can the public in our district request for funds? She like, said there's another round of, of rec grants that will be coming and closing at the end of April. Am I correct? Yeah, there's another round uh, April 30th. They're closing, and if there's any emergency um, applications, we can um, receive those any time of the year. Okay. Any you know, Thank you. At all? You. Yep. Now, I would probably entertain a, uh, a motion to accept them as a as the, the adjusted in our discussion here today, if somebody wanted to make that. Councillor Perry, you're up. I'll make the motion that uh, all the all the adjusted funds be accepted as presented. Second. It's duly moved and seconded. Councillor Garden Cole, you got your light on there before the motion was uh, created, so I'll let you a little leeway. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Sorry, I was just calculating something. Um, and I wanted to contribute to the District 10 project as well. I thought we were going through them individually, or maybe you already passed it. So you want to scroll back up to that there one so we're all on the same page, please? So you want to go, you want to contribute to the EH horn? Yes. Do you have an amount? Yes, I do, $2,830. Duly recorded? Recorded. Now I'm going to, is the mover and the seconder of that motion all right with that? I see thumbs up, so I'm going to accept that change. Anything further, Councillor? That's everything. Thank you. I right, thank you very much. All right. So it's been moved and seconded. What What do you wish? Question. Question has been called. We'll go to the vote. I'm waiting for one person. Ah, oh, there it is. And the vote is in as passed unanimously. And now we go to. Hmm? Huh? Oh, you want to speak? Oh, I'm, I, I'm sorry about that. I didn't hear you. Just leave your mouse, I'll get you. Councillor Hibb, do you want to speak to it? Okay. <clears throat> do you want me to cut Hibb to do it? You're up. You were up. Hedge on. I was just going to uh, a procedural matter. We had discussed possibly going to the policy meeting and then coming back for the uh, in camera part of this meeting. but. We have discovered that it really doesn't allow any staff to leave or doesn't make it any easier procedurally with the camera and recording system. So we'll just can continue as as per the agenda. That was going to be my question. So it's a moot point now. All right. I think I know what you were talking about. Caster. CAO. Uh, through Mr. Chairman, I was just going to say for the um, staff don't have to return for the policy meeting. Shirley and I can handle that. So if staff want to go, then we'll just handle the, the back and forth for the camera. So staff has clear direction. Volunteer. Uh, yeah, yeah, there is. Right. Yes, I know that. But I just want to make sure that staff is in direction. Councillor Hibb. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would just uh, like to, at this time, thank my fellow councillors for their contributions to the walking trails, and I'm sure they'll be very, very happy to be 
receive the extra funds. So thank you. Well put, Mr. Counselor here. All right, returning to the next order of business. You got that evil eye on me. I'm just a little, I'll get it. I'll get, I, know, I got that now. Uh, District of uh, Volunteer Recreation Funds and Mr. Giles, you'll be taking that as well. Right Thank you. Anyway. Uh, so this report um, is summarizing the volunteer nominations that we receive for 2022 that will receive uh, Shining Star Awards at our uh, Municipal Recognition event at the end of April. Um, there also, we choose staff of uh, choose a model volunteer, which um, council would have received a confidential email with that name, and that name will um, remain uh, confidential until the nominee receives their award. Um, so starting in January, uh, we put out social media posts. We did direct communications with community groups via email and required inquiries through the office. We received a total of 14 nominations um, for, for our volunteers. Um, the deadline was February 4, 18th, but we did extend it to February 25th. However, if we um, receive more nominations um, af after today, we'll still um, accept them, but they won't be eligible for consideration for model volunteer. Um, so here's a list of our volunteers um, that all will receive shining stars that were submitted this year. Um, so for, for the model volunteer was identified by, by the event committee made up of Parks Rec and Culture staff. Um, so we have a criteria and pick a, a person out of this list who clearly stands out um, and contributes to their their community. Um, so the event was scheduled to take place on April 29th, which is volunteer week at the Mount Uniac Legion. However, recently while discussing catering with the Legion, they advised us that the kitchen facilities were not suitable for cooking a turkey dinner, that we may need to find an alternate location. So we considered hosting the event at the UNIAC Fire Hall. However, because we have higher attendance due to uh, the extra firefighters we're inviting, um, it kind of put us, our numbers, uh, almost to the limit um, of what the fire hall could hold and um, also looked at their limited parking. So we felt that the, <coughs> this year, maybe Mount UNIAC wasn't suitable, um, but however, once we could hold an event um, that could hold the numbers or had the appropriate um, facilities, we would go there next. So the next closest venue that could accommodate the event would be the Rod and Fire Hall. Um, so we wanted to kind of get as close to Mount Uniac as we could. Um, so um, we, for the motion, um, it's moved that exact committee Executive Committee recommended council approval of the Shining Star nominees provided to date, and that the nomination forwarded by email to council be approved for the Model Volunteer Award and be designated to represent the Municipality of East Hans at the 2023 Provincial Volunteer Awards, and that the location for the 2022 event be re relocated to the Rod and Fire Hall and host in Mount Uniac at the next available time when facilities can accommodate. Thank you, Green. Ladies and gentlemen, you've heard the report. What is your wish? The first up would be Councillor Green. I move the recommended motion. Seconded. Duly moved and seconded by Councillor Hibb. Is there any discussion? Question. They're seeing no one ready, and the question has been called. We'll go to the vote. And the vote is in and is passed unanimously. Anything further, Ms. Giles, on that? Nope, that's everything. Right. Thank you. That brings us to the end of Parks, Recreation, and Culture. Uh, it's been a pleasure chairing this meeting, and I will now turn it over to, I guess, uh, Councillor Michael Perry for the for, uh, his no. corporate services. <laughs> I don't like my
ですよ、あれこれ。All right. We're going to reconvene the Corporate Residential Services Committee. Call to order. First thing I'll be looking to do is looking for a motion to move into camera. So moved. Second. Moved and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. 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 And we will wait.
Thank you. I'd like to report that we met in camera to discuss CAO priorities and personnel matters. We're now looking for a motion to adjourn committee. So moved, so moved and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Executive committee is now adjourned. Are we ready to go or do we have to change the... Okay, folks, uh, we are now going to have a regular meeting of council for policy matters. I would call this meeting to order. And the first item of businesses is from Corporate and Residential Services Committee, Councillor Perry. Thank you, Madam Morden. The committee held this regular meeting on March 22nd, 2022 in council chambers. The following policy related motions are coming forward as a result of the meeting. Discussion of council and public member mandatory proof of vaccination policy. The Corporate and Residential Service Committee recommends council give notice of intent to rescind the council and public member mandatory proof of vaccination policy. As chair of the committee, I so move. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Questions. Questions been called. And the motion has passed unanimously. Next up, update to streetlight policy. The municipality governs the street light service through the street lighting policy. This policy came into effect with the municipality took ownership of street lights in 2001 and installed LED lights throughout the service areas of the municipality. The 10 year street light installation contract recently expired and new contracts have been awarded. The policy requires update as a result. The corporate and residential service committee recommend that council give notice of intent to approve the changes to the street light Council policy as attached to the Executive Committee agenda dated March 22nd, 2022. As Chair of the Committee, I so move. Moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Question. Questions been called. And the motion has passed unanimously. As Chair of the Committee, I move with the option to report. Second. Moved and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. I contrary motion has carried next item on our list is a report from infrastructure and operations committee councillor Musa over to you thank you warden the committee held its regular meeting on March 22nd 2022 in council chambers the following policy related motion is coming forward as a result of that meeting solid waste tipping fee policy the current five years fee schedule will expire March 31st, 2022. The policy update includes a new two-year fee schedule. The Infrastructure and Operation Committee recommend that council give notice of intent to adopt the proposed amendments to the solid waste tipping fee council policy as attached to the executive committee agenda dated March 22nd, 2022, which includes a rate increase of two to 3% annually based on material type. As chair of the committee, I so move. Seconded by Councillor Hebb. Um, is there any discussion? Question. Questions been called. And the motion has passed unanimously. As chair of the committee, I move the adoption of this report. Moved and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Contrary, motion has carried. Next, we'll go to Parks, Recreation, and Culture. Over to you, Councillor Rhino. Committee held its regular meeting on March 22nd, 2022 in Council Chambers. Following policy related motions is coming forward as a result of the meeting. Parks, Recreation and uh, Culture Diversity and Inclusion Strategy and Repeal of Special Needs Policy. Parks, Recreation and Culture Diversity and Inclusion Strategy is set of, of guiding principles that will shape how recreational programs and services are delivered to residents. The strategy reaffirms the municipality's commitment to increase inclusion and access as outlined in the East Hand Strategic Plan 2021 to 2024. So from that, the Parks, Recreation and Culture Committee recommend that council give notice of intent to adopt the proposed Parks, Recreation and Culture Diversity and Inclusion Strategy dated January 2022 20, and repeal 
Is that correct as January, January 2022 and repeal the special needs policy um, last updated in 1993? As chair of the committee, I do so move. Second. Seconded, moved and seconded. Seconded by Councillor Green. Is there any discussion? Okay. Questions been called. And the motion has passed unanimously. And Mortar, Ms. Chair of the Committee, I move the adoption of this report. Second. Moved and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Contrary. Motion is carried. That brings us to the end of our agenda for our regular meeting of council for policy notice. I would be looking for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Moved by Councillor Perry, seconded by the Deputy Warden. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Contrary? Motion has passed unanimously, and folks, we are adjourned.